Coming up, we talk the big three's takeaways from that preseason game number one. The first taste of getting them out there on the court together. What are the expectations as we look ahead to preseason game number two? And what can we confirm about some of those key role players ahead of the regular season? You are Locked On Nets, your daily Brooklyn Nets podcast. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Ah, yes, friends. Welcome into the Locked On Nets podcast right here on the Locked On Podcast Network. It's your team, the Brooklyn Nets, every single day. Over there, you're going to find Doug Nori, owner-operator of DFSR, for all your daily fantasy sports rankings from DraftKings to FanDuel. At Doug Nori on Twitter has got you covered. I'm Adam Armitage breaking down the New York football giants on the One Giant Podcast with my boy Andy Mack. We thank you for making us your first listen of the day free on all those great platforms and let you know today's episode is brought to you by bet online with more props, odds, and lines than ever before bet online. It's where the game starts and Doug, where we're going to start is taking a look back at something that I think is worth covering, but certainly not as important as, as what we see on the court in that first preseason game. Some of the thoughts from the key superstars, Kevin Durant, Kyrie Irving, Ben Simmons, and also head coach Steve Nash, just to get a sense of where did they feel coming out of that first opportunity to step on a court officially and play together. Yeah, um, you know, we didn't we, we talked a couple days ago about what we saw on the court from these guys and that we thought it was mostly encouraging. Uh, just, you know, when, once you assume that or not assume once you know that this was the first time that these guys had ever played together and Simmons was a year out from having played real speed basketball at all. And then we covered the, um, you know, some of the role players and how that didn't overlap, but it is always good to kind of get a feel for how, you know, the, the superstars in this case, how they reacted to being back on the court too. Cause remember, as we covered with media day, you know, this was not like media day needed to be reminded of this, but like this was a really tumultuous off season. And yeah. there are going to be questions asked of these guys a lot, especially if things don't start well. Right. Like, especially if there's a little trouble in, at, at all to start the season or if things don't look super dialed in sooner than later, this, there could be a long season of answering questions here, or at least a long, you know, a long early season of having to stare down potential problems. This is why it's really important for them to get out of the gate strong. Yeah, and I, and I think, you know, we said seeds of success look like they're starting to be planted there early. There's still plenty of questions that we're going to get into, and we hope to get some answers around that. But to your point, as long as it starts to look good and having a sense of where these players are coming from with their own expectations walking out of the court for the first time together, I think that gives you an idea of where they're going to go over the rest of this preseason as we look ahead. So um, when we dive into a handful of these quotes coming out of that first preseason game, I actually really liked uh, Kyrie Irving who was referencing halftime when he was talking with Ben Simmons, who's getting out there, obviously, for the first time in a Brooklyn Nets uniform in front of the crowd at Barclays, who had, by the way, pretty nice crowd for a preseason game. Like, the fan base seems ready to be back and engaged uh, with this team as well. So he was quoted in the postgame, Kyrie, that is saying, I was telling him halftime, referring to Ben Simmons, when you're playing with some high-level players, despite what you heard, we're going to make the game easy for you, Irving said. And he's going to love playing with us. He's going to love getting up and down the floor with me. But for him, for him to be out there, this on his first day, and for us to experience it with him, it's something that we can remember for the rest of the season and something that we got through together. It's day one, highly anticipated, glad it went that way tonight. So I, I, my quick takeaways on that is, reassuring Ben Simmons, who's played with high-level players, but not the high-level players that benefit his game as well, right? So we knew we weren't going to see them. We didn't anticipate seeing them in the second half. So when he says at halftime, he means when our night is over. I'm yeah. letting Ben Simmons know, hey, pretty good to get out there with us. Get a little taste. Don't worry. Kevin Durant and myself are as much about you succeeding on the court as us getting our own. Yeah, and that kind of line of thinking makes sense, right? Like Simmons is going to have the ball a lot here in this offense. It's going to make sense to be on the same page stylistically that they need to all play together. I mean, that's obvious, right? Like they're on the court together. They need to play. Uh, they need to have it sort of flow 
well. Um, you know, him reiterating about the speed and transition um, and the speed at the, the pace that they're going to play. I think you're going to hear this as a talking point and see this a lot on the court of like these guys encouraging each other to play with pace. Uh, I just looked real quick, you know, last season, uh, they ended up finishing 10th in pace overall, which I was like shocked because I just thought of them as a very really slow team. When I was just thinking about them, I was like, oh, this is a super slow team. If they were 10th in the in pace last year, they're going to be like top three this season. So uh, Kyrie, I, right? Like top, I mean, I said top five when I was kind of throwing it out there on Twitter, but that was really a hedge. I, like they should be much faster than that. And so, and, and by the way, just quickly, as you say, the reason why you probably were surprised they were 10th is because of all the times it felt like it got ba- bogged down into those half court that, sets with yeah, everyone in and out right. of the lineups. But yeah, exactly. That's what, exactly what I was thinking. It was like, I was like 10th. My God, I was going to, I mean, I, at some point we had covered this last season and it just had slipped my mind out of it. But then when you hear Kyrie, like kind of, you know, re pushing this idea behind pace uh, with Simmons and reiterating that like, he's part of this group as, you know, as like, as Simmons goes really kind of the other two go as well to some degree. Right. Like, I think, I think he influences their game a bit more than they influence his just because of how they think the nets are going to, play in terms of like who the primary ball handler is and who they're going to run a lot of actions through at least mm-hmm. in the half court also in addition to transition so hearing Kyrie speak like that um, is not surprising but it's encouraging like look are these guys best friends in the world I don't think so but as we've seen with NBA like what happens on the court really is kind of the whole story sometimes <laughs> like like that is what's going dictates. well there turns like, out it's and, going and by, well and by the way just to and just to you know kind of reference Kyrie here Look no further than Kyrie mentioning Kevin Durant as his best friend right after saying that it was kind of embarrassing to <laughs> have him request a trade without him even knowing, right? Like, right. we don't – really what happens on the court is what's going to end up dictating all this stuff too. Like, getting along there is really the only place that they have to get along. I'm not saying they don't get along, but – in the end, the most important place to get along is what happens on the court. So hearing him kind of speak like this after their time together, I think is encouraging. No, a hundred percent. And we're going to get into specifically what Ben Simmons had to say here, as well as Steve Nash, just from a head coaching perspective and getting that first sample before we talk about some of those role players as well. But Kevin Durant, I thought that his post game comments were also just interesting because it was not only maybe a look into how he thought Ben Simmons might be feeling getting on the court, but also how he himself felt after being away from the game, being away for a year, you get a lot of anxiety, not playing Durant said, I know I did just uh, anxious to see how I'm playing, where I'm going to play, what my role is going to be on the team. But as a fan of the game, seeing Kawhi being back out there for basketball, Jamal Murray being back is great for basketball. All the guys that I have known uh, out there who have been injured and being able to play again is a great feeling to see them out there referencing Ben Simmons as well. So, I mean, just a little the little look behind the curtain for him was he felt a level of anxiety or anxiousness around the state of his game. Ben Simmons, as we'll discuss in a second, maybe didn't have those same trepidations. But from a broad stroke standpoint, like Ben Simmons is amongst those group of players in the league that the league is better for it. And as a fan of basketball, you're better for it. That seemed to be, (laughs) I almost found it comical. Kevin Durant seemed to be like referencing his time on the court in preseason game number one from a fan perspective, just enjoying seeing Ben back out there. Yeah, it makes sense. Like it's easy to forget now, but the, we went, just went through a season. He mentions them, no, no Kawhi Leonard. No Jamal Murray, no Ben Simmons, no Zion Williamson. Like none of these, these guys are like, you know, considered top. I mean, maybe Jamal Murray falls a little further down here, but that's like, you know, top 30 at worst, right? Like four of the top 30 players in basketball just didn't even hit the court last season. And that is, it kind of gets sidestepped because of just how everything is sort of shaken out with the team. And then like, you get like, you know, guys who played limited minutes like AD and stuff uh, or limited run. And, and then Kyrie who sat out like two thirds of the season, like this was, that was last season saw a ton of superstar guys not end up playing. So mm-hmm. for Durant, who just, I think is overwhelmingly a fan of basketball and a fan of like sort of the NBA above all, um, it is encouraging to hear him to speak about how on a high level, like this is all just better for the game, right? Like forget about, forget about, you know, some of the personality stuff and forget about, you know, where players maybe want to be and where not like in general writ large, having the NBA have its stars back. And if like I watched Zion last, Oh my God, like Zion looked amazing (laughs) (laughs) last night. Um, So, or two, I mean, depending on when he listened to this two nights ago uh, and his, in his debut. So yeah, just having those, having these guys back on the court, it is easy to forget. We just went through a season where there was, 
upheaval around just he, who even the superstars are. Injuries are always part of the game. I know we're going to talk about more on this here in a second. First, going to talk to you about our friends over at betonline.net, your number one source for betting this season. If you're talking about football, you have to be with Bet Online heading into week five. Buddy, your Giants plus eight right now against the Packers. You know, against Hart, that's a tough one to look at right there. Take it um, in London, baby. Come on now. <laughs> Oh, yeah, London plus eight. That's just a recipe for getting up early. Bet online has got you covered for that and more. They got all the uh, news, all the podcasts, all the line stuff you could ever hope to need or imagine. Uh, in-depth articles, analysis for every single game, live betting up to the minute scores. Not just NFL either. Obviously, they got the NBA rolling. MLB starting the playoffs now. If you're into the fights in the weekends, they have MMA, golf as well. BetOnline.net. You can sign up there. Look at all the different trends, all the different action. Bet online where the game starts. Okay, so I want to cover also um, Coach Steve Nash and just the way he kind of looked at what he got out there in the first preseason game. We'll get into these role players, as we said, and look ahead here to the second preseason game. And, and what are things that we want to kind of get confirmation on low level um, all the way down to the deepest part of the bench or sample sizes from these big three that we think they can certainly build on. But Ben Simmons, it was interesting to me because he basically, he seemed to kind of brush it off. And I almost think the same way that Kevin Durant, he talked about being anxious now. He didn't talk about it necessarily the same way back then. He wanted to play. He wasn't doing anything else. We had those jokes last season. This guy wasn't taking up hobbies while he was away from the game. He's waiting to get back on the court and play basketball. But I, I liked this from Ben Simmons in the post game. It was fun messing up, uh, Simmons said, because I know how good we can be. And seeing just different looks and opportunities there with Kevin and Kai, me and Joe, seeing where they would like to have the ball and just how things are going to work and flow. But the only way you learn is by making mistakes. So I had a few out there tonight and I can go back and watch film and say I know what I can do and what I did wrong and how to fix it. So it's all a learning process for me. So it's good. Like, I just think that you hear everything about that there. And I'm not even overlooking the fact that he specifically mentions Joe Harris uh, when you talk about the best benefits of some of the parts of Ben Simmons games, being a facilitator, finding guys in the right spots. But I think he has the right approach to this, right? You don't want to hear him getting overly anxious, as Kevin Durant said, or being overly critical. It's taste number one, 15 to 20 minutes for you guys. Just go ahead and like the fact that you're out there. And you referenced it, as we talked about in preseason game one. It wasn't all perfect. There was no. a lot of times where you kind of thought, huh, is anyone in the right defensive positions here? Or are guys in the right spots on the offensive end? No. But you have to have some sample size before you can start to make those little tweaks. Great first step forward for Ben. I did think, I mean, we didn't speak about this on the post game where we did, where we broke down the Simmons fit with the Katie and Kyrie. A lot of it was just, you know, coming off some excitement of, of having seen these guys play together for the first time, sort of focusing in on the positives, which I think there were plenty. One thing we didn't really speak about was it was pretty obvious on the offensive end um, when he had the ball that Simmons was a little hesitant and was not, I mean, when they got specifically into, and into half court, I don't mm -hmm. think it was that case in transition where things are moving pretty quickly. And that's always going to be where his bread is buttered. But um, I did think at times in the half court, there was some indecision. There was some sort of slowness on his part, which is to be expected. The game speed, it's like all of a sudden ramped up well beyond anything you can get in practice. The intensity as well, even in a preseason game is well beyond anything you can recreate in practice. So I did think there were times where he was hesitant. Uh, there was a, a, a times where he picked up his dribble. I know some people are like, he picked up his dribble at half court. That's not true. But there were times where he did pre pick up his dribble prematurely and needed to be bailed out. Like that happened with Royce O'Neal mm -hmm. one time where an action started and then stopped too quickly because he, there was some hesitancy. Not a concern, but definitely something you noticed where – Again, and like it would be nuts for it not to be this case. Uh, they, it, you just like you're just you're with a whole new group of people. You're learning the movements. Even guys like O'Neal who and, and Harris who are, or excuse me Harris specifically who hasn't been on the court himself. Like things mm -hmm. are going to move a little slower. The decision making is going to move a little slower. And I think we're probably going to end up seeing that for for a little bit. Right. Like what's going to be through this preseason, maybe even the beginning of the season, where there's times where offensive actions stop earlier than expected, right? Where not everyone is into the place where everyone else expected them to be. Mm -hmm. And Simmons' game specifically needs those things to really get dialed in because he facilitates so much. So, you know, it's not something we spend a lot of time on, um, but I do think that fans would be right to, like, sort of practice patience where that is concerned just because 
where Simmons, his game, he doesn't look to create his own shot in the, in the half court, right? Like that's not something he's going to do. So when the other timing is not going to be completely dialed in, you are going to see times where it's going to look like the dribble get picks, gets picked up. Like there's going to be some hesitancy. There's going to yeah. be some starts and stops. And I think that's just to be expected. No, and you, you need to start to get that rhythm with one another. And it's funny, too, because we're talking about Kevin Durant, Kyrie Irving specifically, but when Nicholas Claxton is out there, how does he position himself? You mentioned Joe. You mentioned Royce, right? Like the other role players, it's different to be a pure spot-up shooter waiting in the corner for your look when Kyrie Irving is on the ball, who's ne almost never going to pick up his dribble right until he sees the right opportunity for himself or for someone else. Ben Simmons can fall a little bit more into that category where potentially – just like Nicholas Claxton, you would say, just in that, in that instance of if all of a sudden Nicholas Claxton has his the ball in his hands and he's picked up his dribble, you know something else has to happen here when he's standing out near the perimeter. So all good things to watch for. Just a couple of quick extra quotes here from uh, Ben before we move on to just Steve Nash and get into this bench and some of the rotation guys. Uh, I'm grateful just to be able to step on the floor, Simmons said. Um, step out on an NBA floor again. I had a lot of fun out there and did mention – just to be clear, that that was the one thing I thought I was going to be nervous, but I wasn't nervous. I was excited, and I think that that's just also good too in terms of the time. I'm not I'm not trying to over you know overstate this. It's just good that he's excited as opposed to being trepidatious. Like let's just specifically talk about from the injury side of things. It's a back injury. There can be real you know hesitation around the physicality and wanting to be able to go full tilt. The fact that he felt excited as opposed to a little bit nervous or a little bit anxious, that's just a positive sign from a physical standpoint, everything else on the court aside. Yeah. And I think too, like, I think where his, his um, comfort level will continue to come in is on the defensive end. I think actually what happens on the defensive end will actually make, ha have him make gains on the offensive end. Right. Because where, where he didn't look, and this is why you know it's not a health thing, where he didn't look hesitant at all was on defense, right? Like that was full energy, full bore. There's a great uh, clip that you can find right now. If you were watching the game, you saw it. It's where he was hounding um, – he was, ha oh, I forget who it was now. It wasn't Maxi. Uh, it doesn't matter. It was one of the, it was one of the Philly ball handlers and he hounds him, almost gets him to go to, to back to, to go into a back court. Because oh yes, 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 yes. Like narrowly holds the line. He's there completely thing. in his pocket. Like yep. he's completely in his pocket. It shuts down the whole possession. The Sixers end up getting a shot clock violation because they couldn't even get into something because Simmons completely crushed the hopes of getting anything going because the ball handler, oh man, I can't remember who it was. Um, the ball handler had to stop reverse course tiptoes along the half court line, gets it out into um, pushes the defensive piece into Harris. And then they they're forced into like a late second shot clock. My point being with this is that where you see Simmons's energy dialed all the way up on the defensive end will end up bleeding over into offense, right? Because yeah. it's going to just make him feel all that more, much more comfortable uh, with what's happening out there. Starts with transition. We saw him completely comfortable in transition as well. It's just that half court piece, but you know, it's not a health related thing when you see him pushing it at full capacity in those other aspects of the game, right? Like on defense, yeah. like in transition. And then that's how you just know the other piece will come. But I think we, I think we didn't talk about, like there was a couple of really nice defensive um sequences for him the pickpocket kind of causing disruption that was just a strict on ball other uh, the guy was buried he just absolutely buried mm -hmm. and, <laughs> whoever it was for the sixers and, and there's a difference there too we'll talk a little about steve nash here in a second but i think just to crystallize that because we wanted to say what are we taking away from game one and looking to see more of I'm curious to see how when Ben Simmons is pushing that pressure, how the responsibilities shift defensively in behind that, right? It, it affords you to be a little bit more aggressive in fronting some guys that are trying to get that ball over uh, from whoever that ball handler happens to be for the opposition. Nicholas Claxton comes to mind as now a player who, what is that secondary assignment? How are you using your length? How are you using your size to potentially prevent the easy outlet pass from there? If you think about any version of this sequence, um, going back to last season, whoever you want it to be, best defensive player coming up for the for the Brooklyn Nets there. It's not going to necessarily be Nicholas Claxton in the same mentality. And on top of which, something we talked about in game number one, the size for Ben Simmons, that changes what it is defensively when your 6'11 frame interferes with the ability to outlet that pass at a reasonable clip. To be able to get it out of your hands and reset that clock for yourself offensively, that's a nice wrinkle that I wonder, is this something that we can start to think about seeing more of as we go into the year? Ben Simmons taking some defensive risks because he has that ability to be disruptive and prevent teams from getting into easy offensive sets. Something that did on the defensive side of the ball 
plague the Nets last season, obviously for a myriad of different reasons, but the lack of talent alone was chief among them. That being the case, let's talk about what Steve Nash had to say here in the first half, essentially overall, and then get into some of these role players as well and set some expectations for preseason game number two. So just to round out thoughts from this first game here, Steve Nash, and this is probably what you would expect the overarching takeaways to be from a head coach and from this team overall. But I was pleased overall, Nash said. I think it's also new. We got through this. And like that, that might be the biggest one, right? Like we got through it. It's the first sample size of doing it. Guys need time together. Ben's playing with a totally different unit than he has in the past, different style. It's going to be ugly at times, but I thought the first half uh, war as the first half were on excuse me you definitely start to see glimpses of the potential the way the ball moved the way they were handling the basketball defensively I thought Ben looked pretty good overall and grew into the game through the first half uh, biggest things there are they know uh, is the acknowledgement that it's going to be ugly is important here and it's important for fans to realize that too you said it there over these first couple of discussion points in the episode it's going to be bad sometimes. It's going to be clunky sometimes, but that has to be a part of the growth process. And Steve Nash also points out, as you and I have mentioned, this is a new unit and a new style of play for Ben Simmons. I think that as much as we talk about Ben Simmons, because he's the biggest new component, it's also going to be new for Kevin Durant, Kyrie Irving, Joe Harris, Royce O'Neal, everybody else on this roster. Ben Simmons is a unique skill set for his size and the position that he plays and the talent that he is. So every, everyone is making a bit of an adjustment here. Seeing that there's going to be some lumps is okay. And then hearing Steve Nash say that he thinks it overall was a positive building process through the first, we're going to call 30 minutes, uh, 24 minutes, excuse me, of game action. Yeah. And I think like for Nash too, who comes from a style, uh, at least when he played of, of just kind of pressing pace more than anything else, we saw him trying to press pace last year and just kind of not always being met with it actually happening on the court. Mm -hmm. To some degree, I think that was just because their personnel didn't totally lend, lend to it, right? Like they, were really short on ball handlers that could really do that after Harden. And even Harden, honestly, isn't a pace setter. Like he is a, you know, gr a grab the ball, grab a rebound, and then kind of, you know, find cross matches or find himself his own kind of shot. But he wasn't a lightning fast, like down the court guy. Right. You and I like talked that. about that when Kyrie Irving came in. It was Kyrie Irving wants to push the pace. James Harden was willing to push the pace. And there's a big difference. Yeah, exactly. Right. And, and he still did. Like, they still played with pace at times. But, like, you know, if you think about stylistically what Harden's game was predicated on, it was kind of like finding, you know, finding mismatches, which he was really good about doing, finding himself into good, you know, situations where he could get to the rim. But not often was it happening in transition. Um, yeah. That was just not something that he did a ton. And then last year when he was gone, they really, except for Kyrie and to some degree KD, like they really didn't have anybody on the team who could do that. Now they have Simmons. I think we could see it from some there. We already know Kyrie wants to do it. Um, they have other guys on this team now that, are at least going to, I mean, Simmons alone to, for starters, but they have other personnel that are going to want to do this. So Nash, like knowing like that will get a clunky too. Like when you play yeah. fast, you're, it's going to, it's going to look great for you at times. And it's not going to look so great for you at times. But I, I think that with the team that they have now, the, the positive, it's clearly the positives are going to far outweigh the negatives over the course of the season. Like we just might not see it come all to fruition now, but we know that Nash wants to do this. Like this is how he played. He doesn't want to get, into like long half court sets with this, with this group of guys, like you never want to do that. Like you want to make this as hard for defenses as possible, getting guys like Kyrie and Katie into cross matches, coming down the court, getting Simmons out into the open court where we already saw him sort of flash some of the upside that he has there. Even getting guys like Claxton that we know can run the court really, really yeah. well. Like that is the group of guys that is has to play fast. Like have yeah. to, they have to, have to, have to, they have they really have no choice like that has to be the way they play. It's, it's going to look weird on defense sometimes, but Nash, one would think <laughs> Nash is, is like the perfect guy to sort of kind of mold that, like mold that to be the case. We saw it a little yeah, the with mentality, Dantoni. right? Yeah. yeah. D'Antoni, when he was on the bench, we saw him them wanting to do that. D'Antoni left. They kind of got away from it a little bit because of probably the scheme and because of the coaching and because of the personnel. But I, it's just like, it's just to go back to what we said at the beginning, this team is going to be like blistering blistering pace as it goes through the season you'd like to think so if they're going to be success successful at the highest level involves being that type of team that plays at a high pace that being the case then though um, as we look ahead to the second preseason game for the Brooklyn Nets takeaways you know we talk so highly about Edmund Sumner and what we saw from him in preseason game number one we like the sample size 
um, from Watanabe as well. It's going to be against the, uh, obviously, the Miami Heat here for preseason game number two, which actually could be good um, from an offensive perspective, a team that is known for its defense. So you can get some nice challenges there, depending on how long they play some of their veterans. But what is the first thing coming up here in the second game that you want to see more of? And we can go high level in some ways. I almost like I tend to get away from what we see from these big three, just in the terms of we know that's a gradual process and we know what their skill set is. I am mildly intrigued about some of the lower level guys. And if we see consistency from them in game number two, which just means are, you know, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, that those bodies are getting more slotted in with confirmation as opposed to being ambiguous, because that's as important as anything here, I think is the consistency you're going to get from the next five guys after the starting unit. Okay. Well, I mean, for starters, as of the recording of this episode, it doesn't appear like anyone's going to sit. It feels like it's, it appears like everyone is going to play in this game. Um, yeah. So if, that, if that's the case, okay, just number one on a high level, are they running out the same rotation, same starting five? That's my assumption. Is it the same really short eight man rotation that uh, for the first half that they did, or do we see some of those other guys begin to maybe bleed in here? I mm-hmm. would be, uh, I would, pr- I would be the proponent to just keep it the eight. Like just for now, I think that's more important to get the like that's going to be like your, if you're an eight na- eight to nine man rotation to start the season because you need to get these guys a lot of reps. I don't think we need to figure out the other guys with this group right now. Um, maybe some people want to push back on that. I that, I wouldn't hate. Like, see, I'll say this: I wouldn't hate seeing. I don't need to see it, but I wouldn't hate seeing um, seeing what Sumner might look like if he's there for the Patty Mills minutes as, a, as opposed to the other way around, just to get a taste. If he gets a little bit more with some of these starters there, like that might not be the worst thing to see well, early and, on knowing what you have in Patty. And remember too, like it was an eight man rotation in this first game, but it's really nine. Cause Seth Curry's definitely part of that group and he's just not playing right, right now. Right. So that's really the top nine of guys. And at that point, I mean, how much do we need to see the other players if you know who's going to make the team? Because now you you know right now they're a nine-man a nine man group at least, right? Um, with the starting five that we already knew, it was Royce O'Neal for sure, Patty Mills for sure. We saw Sharp get enough of those backup center minutes that like it looks like he's going to be used at least in some capacity. And then you had Seth Curry there, so you're already nine, nine guys deep. That's where I think I would just assume see it like the same eight Yep. I know what you're saying. It makes sense. Like it makes sense. I want to see all these guys play with the other guys too. And as and look, at some point they will because injuries and rest and all this other stuff, it ends up happening. But it's just too important right now for them to get reps among the core group of guys. So right. I I did like that they were somewhat aggressive around I do like that they were somewhat aggressive about how many minutes those guys played for a half, right? Like they played a lot of minutes um for for one half of basketball. I mean, like knowing they were gonna sit for the second half may help that make sense. I would like to see that again. Um, and I know that's just like not a groundbreaking thing to say, Oh, I want to see the guys play a lot of minutes, but that's just not how every team attacks the preseason. We just saw the Sixers sit and beat and harden, right? They don't need to play. It doesn't need, we don't need to go nuts with some of these guys that, especially when you know what you have, like why waste tread on the tire, but the Nets just aren't in that situation. So I think keep it tight with the rotations. Those guys that played in the second half, I don't need to see them at all with the first group. Uh, right now. I mean, do you agree with that? Or like, I, I know you threw in some there, but I mean, does that make no, no. sense? What I'm saying yeah, what you think yeah. about the team. And I, I, it's like the Patty Mills one. And it's almost, you know, it's funny because reminding that Seth Curry is obviously a part of that top nine rotation. So that's a big part of maybe what the role looks like for Sumner in some ways, you know, the outside shooting, the athleticism, et cetera, on ball ability. Um, so yeah, I, I'm fine with it because at some point, you do want to feel like we saw Joe Harris in the starting unit in the first game. Is that what it is? And Royce O'Neal is that first guy we want to see coming off the bench in the role that he has. We, you want to get a sense of consistency in that top eight unit. So uh, while I get excited about some of these other players, I'm fine with it being the consistent top eight. I'd like to see Dayron Sharp kind of settle himself down a little bit, right? Still some of the same kind of areas of concern for him. I, I think that he's there. I think that it feels so familiar to the timeline around Nicholas Claxton and his development where you see these little things and then he's still kind of clunking his way along. So so watching for how he looks in this game is important. Seeing Watanabe play consistent again is important because then, just to your point, top eight, that's what I want. I want the consistency from those guys. Nine with Seth Curry, you know, 12, whatever it's going to look like, three guys on this team are going to sit at the back end of the bench and never see the court all season. But all the way up to the 11th and 12th guy, they're going to have roles here. So I'd like to just get affirmation around that. And if I'm low-level thinking about it, I will say, um, for everything that DDJ showed in Summer League, 
I expect them to still give him the same look of opportunity that he had in game number one for the fact of let's just confirm or deny. Like, oh, do we think that you can do something here or is it automatically off the table and you should be down in the G League and that's not a bad thing, but let's take you out of the equation. Let's elevate Sumner already into that higher profile role and again, start to refine what the top end of our roster is going to look like. Yeah, I got to tell you, I, like, I'm almost as excited for this game as I was for the first. Like, this is all still very new. The first one yeah, was yeah. just unwrapping the gift, but now it's like time to like really kind of sit the around together the tree. and see what this yeah, thing can do. Together. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Like, I still feel that same kind of um, yeah, excitement. Like, there's, it felt like not enough. Like, I would have, I was like, yeah, play 40 minutes and see it. Like, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> back I know to backs, maybe back to back, same night. Of course, <laughs> play every minute. I mean, I think we're so devoid as fans, you know, or covering the team as like having been able to see one, something that you can get excited about. Like last season was just one big plotting mess. Um, yeah. that was hard to ever get really excited for anything because you never got to the, you never got to the point where it was all together on the court. Finally having it happen has not worn off for me at all. After this first game, uh, it's wow. like, if anything, I'm, if I'm, I'm basically the same level as going into this game against Miami. So still wanting to see it, hope that everyone gets hope that everyone plays. I mean, I'll be, you'll see me in a, in a pretty bum state if they just decide to like, oh yeah, we saw enough. We're going to just try out this other guys. That would be, that would be a pretty rough one. I, we got to get out of here. <laughs> um, uh, we'll be, we'll come. We did this thing. We did this. Well, we're going to try to do this as much as possible. Like, but we did live right after the game on YouTube uh, following our post game reaction. We're going to do that this time. We might actually at this time might even jump in as the game's ending and then start broadcasting. And then the actual podcast itself will be cut in like, cut into the real time but you're only going to be able to see that if you're on youtube so you have to make sure you subscribe over to the youtube channel set alerts so you know when we're going live uh we've seen massive uptick in followers over there and we really appreciate it so make sure you like and subscribe over on youtube we'll be coming at you live right after the game against miami whether it's early in the morning for the podcast or late at night for the youtube premiere it's about being someone that's ready at all times and in that sense i'm an early bird and i'm a night owl so i'm wise and i have worms michael scott Ah, one of the all-time great poets. Used a lot here on the podcast, too. We will be back again tomorrow talking more Brooklyn Nets basketball.